On a cold winter's day in 1921, Paul Bears carried the body of one of the great theologians of the 19th and 20th centuries to a gravesite in Princeton, New Jersey. Writing to his mother afterwards, J. Gresson Machen would remark that when they carried B.B. Warfield's body out, that old Princeton went out with them. Old Princeton had been the primary seedbed for pastors and missionaries in the Presbyterian Church. But now, more than 100 years from its founding, the roots of declension had taken hold and modernist theology had made inroads, even infiltrating the pulpits and pews of the Presbyterian Church. As Machen saw it, Warfield's commitment to ancient truth had been the last vestige of orthodoxy, keeping Princeton from a catastrophic embrace of liberal theology. Over the next 15 years, J. Gresham Machen's struggle to preserve an orthodox Presbyterianism would become a touchpoint of the larger fundamentalist controversy, boiling over in churches all around the United States. His book, Christianity and Liberalism, precipitated a series of events that culminated in Machen and other professors leaving Princeton in 1929 and planting a new seedbed for pastors and missionaries called Westminster Theological Seminary. Then, in the 1930s, Machen would break away from the mainline Presbyterian Church and establish a new denomination devoted to faithful teaching of God's ancient word, an idea completely antithetical to the most influential and powerful forces of the day. Politics, technology, identity, power, science, everything seems to be changing. So why not faith? This is Christianity and Liberalism, a podcast based on the book by J. Gresham Machen. In this show, we'll be discussing a modern day church in crisis and engaging with Machen's classic text to see what lessons we can learn and apply 100 years later. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand We bring the antithesis, the lamb's dripping wrist Is still the only answer for man's wickedness The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man Upon the rock of the word of God we will stand CNL with Machen we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell In this episode, we're taking a detour from our exploration of the ideas in the book Christianity and Liberalism to learn more about the man who wrote it and what inspired him to risk everything in a courageous stand for truth against the tides of modern ideology. We'll speak with a few Machen experts on this show, but not many know Machen's story better than Stephen Nichols. Stephen is president of Reformation Bible College in Sanford, Florida, and the author of several books, including J. Gresson Machen, A Guided Tour of His Life and Thought. We began our conversation about Machen's early life in Baltimore. Uh, what was Machen's childhood like? Where did he grow up? Who were his father, mother, and siblings? And what are some tidbits of information from that early life that really help us to understand the making of the man who wrote Christianity and Liberalism? Machen grew up in Baltimore. He was born in 1881. His father was a lawyer, Arthur Machen, and his father was an attorney, Louis Machen, and actually not just any attorney. He was at one time the attorney for the United States Senate. So this was a this was a rather prominent family, the Machens. But when his father, uh, Arthur Machen, uh, went off to Harvard uh, to study law, he wanted to sort of make a go of it for himself. Uh, he could have easily depended upon his you know, family's means to support him, but he decided, put him, he decided he would put himself through law school. And he wrote detective stories, if you can believe it, uh, to fund his law education. So he graduates from Harvard, decides to set up shop in Baltimore in 1853 as a bachelor. He's there for 20 years, and then he meets Mary Gresham. Now, she's from an Old South family in Macon, Georgia, a family of significant means, and uh, she's known as Minnie, and they get married in 1873. There's going to be three sons born to the Machens, 
Arthur C. Arthur Jr. is the oldest. John Gresham goes by Jay Gresham is the middle child, and then Thomas uh, is the third. So, what kind of a home was it? Right, uh, it's very Victorian. Uh, if you can imagine a Victorian uh, townhome in the city in the 1880s, 90s, zeros, that was the Machen home. Um, Arthur Machen not only wrote books, he loved books. So the upstairs would have been dad's library with fine leather bound volumes um, that probably the kids could not even touch or take off the shelf, right? Yep. Uh, so that was a little bit of a childhood home. Machen talks about the formative influences being the Bible, of course, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and Pilgrim's Progress. So he would have had a solid education in all of those. Did he really enjoy the catechism? <laughs> you know, my kids are, I make my kids. Behind that. <laughs> I think as a good Victorian child, he did whatever his parents told him to do. But I do find this funny, uh, David, when, when um, he kept his report, Machen was a bit of a pack rat, which makes writing on him pretty easy because he kept everything. And he kept some of his report cards from his elementary school days or grammar school days. It would have been called. And it, when he was 10, he was ranked first in his class in every single subject except one. And that was conduct. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's say he excelled at his studies, but maybe he was a little mischievous, like a, <laughs> a not, not like a, not malicious, more like a prankster mm, mischievous. Yes. So when, when, you talk about, I mean, his affection for his mother is evident. Oh, totally. He just loved her. And in yeah. Stonehouse's uh, biography, he says, like, no one even rivaled the affection and the sympathy that he received from her. Um, what did what did that consist of growing up? How, how did that become such a defining mark of Machen's commitment to his family, honor, honoring his parents, and then also throughout his life, just kind of depending on her throughout his his time in Germany, for example, right. and to the end of her life. Yeah. Well, every one of his books is dedicated to her. So that's fascinating, right? Um, I, I think the home for Machen was incredibly formative. Uh, his dad's his dad, I think at the time he held the record for arguing the most cases in the in the sort of region, something like 204 cases he argued. So he was a brilliant litigator um, and just had that decisive lawyer's mind that could break down and analyze, well, that's going to come to serve Machen as a scholar. And it's going to serve him very well as he engages with his theological opponents. Uh, his mom also published a book. She wrote a book in 1902, published a book in 1902 with Macmillan, of all publishers, called Browning in the Bible. And so this is Robert Browning, the poet, you know, very Victorian again, and the Bible. And so she's instilling her love for the Bible, her love for the classics, her love for literature uh, in, in her son. And of course, they're all members of the Presbyterian Church. So so there's that. Uh, and she's from Southern Presbyterianism. So there's that tradition that's rich. But yeah, no, I think you're right to see the house in that way, the home in that way, and to see uh, Machen as being very much shaped uh, by his mom. And while there's a ton of correspondence with the mom, it's also the dad's influence too. He just, he could say in sentences what she took pages. <laughs> to write. <laughs> and so, so uh, he would offer pretty much the same advice, but usually like in a sentence. He was a lawyer. That makes a lot of sense. His time was very valuable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. So, so then connecting his love for his parents and the formative shaping that took place in the home, how does that relate to some of the the critiques that he has in Christianity and liberalism in education? Uh, did it extend to thinking about the family? Hmm. Uh, what what were his, is there any connection between those two things? Oh, absolutely. You know, there's, 
first of all, his father was like politically libertarian and Machen was political libertarian, but he also was very careful to see the church as a voluntary society. And that's a very important point he wants to make in Christian liberalism. He's not forcing people to believe something. Uh, he's saying, you're free to believe whatever you want. He's a true libertarian. The, the issue is, can you believe whatever you want and still call it Christianity when it is not even a shadow of the real thing? Um, so you see some of those influences come out, uh, and you also see them come out in some of his other writings, maybe more so than Christian liberalism. Um, but no, there definitely was an influence. And I, I think especially the, the way in which uh, Machen went about analyzing a problem, uh, that seems to me to be the real key that he picks up and his insightfulness uh, to, to sort of cut through the 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 surface and really get to the heart of the matter and and state it in a way that's compelling. Um, that that I think is the biggest takeaway. What was he like? What was he like around his friends? Uh, you you kind of said earlier that he struggled in his conduct as a child. Uh, <laughs> uh, did he struggle in college? Did he <laughs> um, was he a jokester? He liked sports. Uh, I remember seeing this one quote from one of his letters said he loved watching football so much he couldn't stand uh, seeing a vacant field in Germany. And this is what he said, this benighted people, which does not seem to hear the voice of nature when she commands every human being to play football or watch it being played. <laughs> is there anything to that that gives us a holistic picture of who Machen was? Yeah. At this point, and then all the way through his life, he is all about uh, enjoying life and course he had the means to do that but it was more than that he um he loved this sort of club atmosphere so you know as bachelors living in a big victorian home in princeton with fellow seminarians he loved that uh he didn't stay in alexander hall his i think stayed in there his first year as a student second year he was down the street a little bit in one of the big homes and there's a picture of them all on the porch you know, they had the dog as a mascot for the house. It's basically like a fraternity at seminary. And you can just see Machen is just right in the thick of it and lo loving it. He's, as I say, he's taking notes in Voss's class and writing notes to his classmates. Like, could you imagine Voss having to stop lecturing and saying, would the man in the back row kindly stop sharing notes <laughs> so I can lecture? Um, and then he does his own pranks once he comes back to Princeton in 06 as an instructor. And of course, he lives in Alexander Hall up on the top floor. And uh, the legend has it that on Saturday evenings or Friday evenings, he would order in fresh boxes of fruit for the students. And he also liked his tobacco. And so this was a different era where you would, you know, smoke in a dorm room. And so he would throw open his, his room for all of his students to come up and enjoy fruit and good nicotine and enjoy some conversations with each other. So that's very much the picture. He's not a dour, depressed, what am I, uh, dark Gothic person by any stretch. Um, I think he's a very gregarious outgoing. He, he would go to New York just to watch plays um, and love the theater in New York City. So, yeah, very fascinating. And that and that's true, you know, for Machen, uh, really uh, up until his final days. That was part of his, his life. Yeah, I remember someone saying that he had this unusual capacity for friendship as well. Mm -hmm. and And yet he also only had one relationship that didn't quite work out. So he's a bachelor for the rest of his life. Yes. Uh, is there anything there that helps us again to uh, reconstruct the author of Christianity and liberalism? <laughs> yeah. So his family, uh, this was what they did in those days. You'd shut your office down in July, August, and you'd go to your vacation home. And they had a home on Seal Harbor in Maine. And um, it, it was up there in the enclave uh, that he had the one interest in his life. And uh, they corresponded often, but they were really, they just weren't on the same page. She was she was a rather society person. Uh, 
And while Machen was a society person, I don't think any of that ever really appealed to him. And so that that just never materialized on the on the friendship side. You know, absolutely. And while uh, you you see it first of all in um, Warfield as more of a mentor relationship uh, to Machen. And you see the closeness of Machen to Warfield. And honestly, I think Warfield's death in 1921, more than any, really propelled Machen into the limelight. It's it's like he's picking up the mantle now. And and two years later comes Christian liberalism. You know, mm. Warfield is the line of Princeton. But then when he um leaves Princeton in 29, he's friends with Army, he called him, William Park Armstrong. So you know, he leaves Princeton, goes over across the Delaware River, Philadelphia, and starts Westminster. But on Sunday afternoons, he goes back to Princeton and has dinner in the home of the Armstrongs. It does this for years, uh, just because of the friendship that they had. And Mrs. Park Armstrong, Mrs. Army, uh, would send money to Westminster as a donation. And she'd put in it a little note that would say, it's so hard for us to work at one seminary when our heart is at another. Um, wow. Yeah. And then, of course, his friendship with John Murray as a colleague. Um, and I mean, these were these were foxhole buddies. Like Machen, okay, he was fine financially in life, but his life was anything but uh, conflict free from the moment he decides I'm going to enter the fray 1922 to the time he dies. He is a subject of controversy. Um, he's called a theological bigot. He gets anonymous hate mail at Princeton. And one of them writes real big professor of bigotry, AKA in, uh, professor Machen. Um, so He's in controversy with his, he gets kicked out of his own denomination because he wants to be faithful to it. Uh, and there's even then a misunderstanding uh, within the group that founded Westminster when he does get kicked out of his denomination. That's 29. When he does uh, respond to the missions issue in the church in 33, 34, he has a little riff within the circle that that founded Westminster. Um, because now he's going to be embroiled with his denomination and he's going to get kicked out of it and, and eventually start what become what is the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, so those friendships meant a great deal to him. The colleagues at Westminster, these weren't just colleagues that exchanged niceties in the faculty lounge. Um, they were they were deep in the battle mm. together. Um and uh, you you get you get the camaraderie, the sense of it. The world Jay Gresson Machen grew up in was different than the one Christianity and liberalism had in view years later. From the 1880s to the 1920s, the United States expanded culturally and geographically in ways difficult to imagine, even in our own day. The world Machen grew up in was one filled with horse and buggies, populated by Civil War veterans. But by the time he died in 1937, he was hosting a groundbreaking radio series. Progression marked this era, but not every area of life progressed equally. Southern sentiment was a real thing in Machen's life. Many family members were Confederate soldiers, and his church in Baltimore, Franklin Street Presbyterian, was known for their Southern sympathies. Even Machen's view of the race question, writes Nedby Stonehouse, was distinctly Southern and he actually opposed B.B. Warfield's rejection of racial or ethnic segregation at Princeton Seminary, which is captured in a well-known letter that he writes to his mother, a letter that we'll dive into in a later episode. Throughout his career, the libertarian streak and keen legal mind which Machen inherited from his father would put him at odds with the institutions that had wandered off course from their founding principles. But he would also find it difficult to adapt to a culture that had recovered deeper principles of equality for all. So when we think about that upbringing, uh, it was in the South, and sometimes the South has certain connotations. Uh, 
and he came from a fairly wealthy family in the South. What were some of the Southern distinctives that shaped Machen as a thinker, as one who engaged culture, society, and any of his thought life? So it's very interesting. Baltimore is below the Mason-Dixon line, but it's right up against it. And it, it was a little bit of a different city. It, it had a Southern location, but it wasn't, you know, deep South. Um, so that that's kind of interesting. And of course, it's a little bit more uh, um, built up in modern and recent times, contemporary times of, of Machen. And the other thing I always found interesting was Machen doesn't go to one of the Southern Presbyterian seminaries. He goes to Princeton, which is clearly Northern. And I always found that an interesting piece. And we'll get into his Princeton years, I'm sure, as this conversation goes on. Did, did, he, did he attend a Southern church? It would have been... It would have been reunited, but hit, but the church that he was part of was was probably more in the old tradition of the Southern Presbyterianism, which would have had that confessionalism as part of its identity more than the Northern churches. But I think it also shows that Machen was, in many ways, like a lot of the folks we see not only in church history, but that we see in biblical history, is that they come to us not pristine. Right. Imagine that they're not sinless. <laughs> Heaven uh, forbid. <laughs> <laughs> so just as our biblical heroes have flaws and our church history heroes have flaws, um, you know, th there was a sense in which I think some of that Southern identity did influence Machen. And uh, of course, many want to point to Machen having a, a segregationist uh, approach to things and you know, as we think about this, we we have to recognize that our our heroes have legs of iron and feet of clay, and we we can't just give them a pass. Uh, but I'm not so sure we need to accept the verdict of culture to cancel them either. And from our point of view, I think it's almost hubris to to say, therefore, we have nothing to learn from you. Um, we just sort of cast you aside. So, so I think as we engage Machen. Um, whoever it is. We do the same thing with Luther or Edwards. Um, we, we just need to, I think, be thoughtful and about it and um, like I say not give anybody a pass, but still be humble enough to say, we can still learn from this person and we still admire them even in terms of what God did through them. Yeah. And we so quickly cancel people and we need to replace a cancel culture with a grace culture. Oh, <laughs> there no, needs yeah. to be forgiveness. Um, now, when we think about I mean, the Civil War is fresh in his memory. He's got family members who are who served in the uh, were Confederate soldiers, and others who wasn't there an uncle who didn't take a district attorney position, I believe, because he might have to go against some of his southern brethren. Um, there's some commitments going on there. Yeah, the, the especially the Gressoms. Were in, in, they were from Macon, Georgia, and had interest in railroads and, um, well, a lot of things. And so I think that those family connections were very Southern. And Machen, of course, visited as a youngster, and they, of course, would come up and visit him, her siblings, so his aunts and uncles. So all that was part of, of Machen's upbringing. Um, and all all part of his world. Yeah. Well, I, I'll never forget, uh, before coming up here to Westminster, I came across that letter to his mother. Uh, and I was kind of shocked about it, but was able to understand it in the ways that you've just laid out. But is there any sort of historical context that would help us or within the time itself or a Southern mindset that would help us today in 2023? Yeah, I think they were just over affected by the culture in which they were a part of. And it's interesting, Warfield had just as similar bona fides as a Southerner. Um, there was a the, Breckinridge was the vice president of the Confederate States of America. Um, but Warfield, as you know, was rather famously anti segregationist. 
And it was actually a little bit of a contentious piece for Machen. And that's part of the letter you're referring to, was prompted by Machen's disagreement with Warfield over segregationism. And so, you know, here you have one person who's in that same context, who by God's grace is able to recognize the problems of that context and within it even sort of rise above it. And here you have another person who's within it and doesn't think through all the implications of it and is is sort of too reflective of it. And, you know, all this, I think, just helps us say, wow, what, what are the next generations going to say about us? <laughs> like, exactly. what blind spots do we have when it comes to thinking about our fellow human beings and how we use our resources? Um, so again, I'm, I, I think we, we see ourselves too uh, pr- proudfully if we think we are not immune to yeah. the ebbs and flows of our day and age. Oh, I think about that a lot. I, I'm writing a Philemon commentary and thinking about right. slavery quite a bit. And it's funny how we have our forms of slavery that we completely ignore uh, in a saturated porn culture and mm-hmm. all that comes with pornography and the slavery that still exists that we totally find acceptable as speaking as a normal, uh, unbelieving person in America as something that is just over there, but we're not going to take any steps to eradicate. It's just interesting how we have our sins that we overlook. Um, yeah, we give ourselves a pass. With the benefit of hindsight, it's clear to us that God, in his providence, was shaping young J. Gresson for a life of education in theology for the sake of the church. But that path wasn't always clear to Machen. For a long time, like a lot of people, Machen didn't know what he was supposed to do with his life. Yeah, that's a great segue uh, for considering the different schools that Machen went to and yeah. how that educational career shaped him. So how, how did it shape them? Yeah, so he went to Hopkins and he studied classics and he his time there coincided with Gildersleeve, who, I mean, if with a name like Gildersleeve, you know, you you got one career ahead of you, it's you're gonna be a classicist. So so this is who Machen is studying under. And of course, he's top of the class. He wins the classics prize. And now it's it's 1901. He does Hopkins in three years. Um, it's 1901 and he honestly, I don't think he knows what to do with his life. He goes out to the university of Chicago and spends a term studying international finance and banking with either a view to business or a view to some kind of law in, in the area of finance, which was his dad had a lot of bankruptcy cases. And then, uh, he's only a semester there. And then he goes back home and is a semester at Hopkins, just doing graduate studies. And his pastor says to him, you know, (laughs) I mean, this is a terrible thing, but, you know, since you don't know what to do with your life, have you thought about going to seminary for a couple of years (laughs) and studying the Bible? And you should think about Princeton. And Machen said, well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be a minister. And he said, well, you don't have to be a minister just because you go to seminary. Go study the Bible and see what comes of it. So off he goes, 1902, uh, to Princeton. And he enrolls at the seminary and the university, and he studies a philosophy track at the university, and he ends up getting an MA in philosophy from Princeton. And in those days, the MDiv was called the BD, the Bachelors of Divinity, but it's equivalent to the MDiv today uh, that he did at, at Princeton Seminary. And we can pick up the story there. Uh, mm. But it was, it, I still don't think he knows what he wants to do with his life. I got to tell you one quick story, though, from his days at Princeton Seminary. He, two quick stories. Perfect. If Princeton was playing a football game, university was playing a football game, Machen would cut class to go watch Princeton football. So let's remember that. But we also have his notebooks from his seminary days, and he'd write notes to fellow students, and they and they all had nicknames for each other. So it'd be like, wake up, scooter, or something like that. But then one, he writes on it real big, I flunked Voss. So, so this is, of course, Gerhardus Voss, 
who's the great biblical, you're like, he's at the headwaters of what you do, right? Yeah. And uh, Machen writes, I flunked Voss. That makes me feel better. That's great. <laughs> um, it, and I've heard that he's actually wasn't the greatest teacher either. So <laughs> maybe it was pedagogical. <laughs> That's what it was. It was Machen. He was, and you know, like the note starts off pristine and lined up and then they start going like downhill and it's almost like he's falling asleep as, as he's just taking. <laughs> now, when we think about his educational career as well and some, some people who influenced him, yes, uh, whether we want to go to Princeton or whether we want to go to Germany, in Germany, it seemed that he had this deep intellectual and religious experience, as he would put it one of the most overwhelming ones of his life. Yes. What happened out there? <laughs> First, why was he in Germany? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, so there was a paper prize in the senior class who could write the best paper and um, for the students. And the prize, I mean, get this, the prize was you got funded for your doctoral studies in Europe. And so, but there was also this sort of unwritten kind of, understanding that you'd come back and spend two or three years as sort of an instructor at the seminary, and then you'd go off on your career. So Machen won the prize, it was afforded the opportunity to study, but he said, I'll, I'll take the prize, but I won't take any money. He didn't want to be obligated to Princeton and he didn't need it. And uh, his, as Daryl Hart, the, of course, Machen's biographer says, his father was long on patience and long on resources. Uh, so that actually may have been not in Machen's favor to delay his decision-making, but at any rate, he goes to Germany and he goes to Marburg and then he goes to Göttingen. And there he studies under Hermann, who is like the liberal of liberals, but who was also one of the most pious men he's ever met. And you know, you know us Presbyterians, we are very careful to keep our piety private. Um, so so Machen, I think, is seeing, uh, getting to now your question, Machen is, is seeing a, an expression of piety that really wasn't something that was part of his experience. And um, he's a little rocked by it. But I also think some of that, honestly, I think is a little overdone because I think he sends some to his mom, and I think she misunderstands what he's saying. And then the two of them sort of go back and forth for a while. And honestly, at one point, the dad steps in. And I think he sort of steps in to call a truce, a timeout, let's clear the air. I don't think you're really saying that. I don't think you're really saying that. And and then everything sort of settles down. Um, and Machen comes back. But so I want to, I don't want to diminish it. But I think sometimes we overblow it as well. Um, but no, it did give Machen pause. And it also, I think, was one of those things that just now he's seeing ah, the true danger of liberalism, because if someone can make a case that a person loves Jesus, regardless of what they believe about Jesus, that's a very dangerous thing. We're not talking about people who don't love Jesus. Uh, we're talking about people who say they love Jesus. They just don't believe anything literally about what the Bible says about them. Um, that's a dangerous thing. And and Machen sees that. And I think that helps him too in his fight against liberalism when he gets back. So when Stonehouse says then that, uh, that Hermann completely countered false perceptions of liberalism in Machen's mind... It's it's the it's the distinction between what one believes and what one feels about what one believes. Yeah. That's that's the false perception, and then that rocks him to his core in a way that I didn't really expect. Uh, he then realizes that he is sinful, hmm. and it, it becomes like this. Well, I'm sure he realized it before, but it becomes this emphasis. It seems when when he when he's talking about uh, the call to ministry, he says uh, in one of his letters, for me to speak of the Christian ministry in one breath with myself is hypocrisy. Yeah. yeah. I, what's going on there? So I actually think this might be what's going on from the beginning. He, um, I, I think he was built to be a minister. 
but I think he resisted it. And so I think that's what you see with 1901, 1902. I think that's what you see with him turning down the money to study in Europe because he doesn't want to be obligated. When he gets back from Europe, he will accept a position of instructor, but only if he it doesn't have a string attached to it that he has to get ordained. Now, all that's going to change in, in 1910, 12, but in the 19 zeros, I don't think that's in play. And I think it, I think he's resisting the call uh, that he is both naturally gifted for, like has the competencies, uh, but also is being truly called. And he's sort of resisting it, I think. By the time Machen had completed his studies and returned from Germany, his outlook had changed. What he saw and learned abroad had opened his eyes to changes on the home front. Now, Machen was in World War I. Yes. Uh, he goes off to Europe. He serves in the YMCA. Right. Uh, and then when he returns, he finds himself at odds with the changing seminary and church, yes. Princeton and the PCUSA. What is happening in these places that initiates yeah. this conflict? I think Machen comes back a changed man. We're no longer trying to find a purpose. <laughs> he comes back with purpose. And, um, you know, not to diminish his war experiences, they were, they will change your life. I mean, World War I, the carnage was horrible. And Machen was there right off the front lines in France. Um, so, yeah, how could this not impact you, right? So, so coming back, he's changed and his denominations changed. And essentially, America, I think, was spared. We didn't have the war here. We didn't enter too late. Of course, tens of thousands of lives were lost. But in France and Germany, it's millions that are lost. So America's... It's the 20th century is progress and optimism and culture is modernism. And basically modernism no longer has time for sin, salvation, God. And now you have churches who are wondering, well, what happened to our country? We used to be the influential institution and we have people leaving us in droves. So what do these churches do? Well, under the myth of influence, they think if we can accommodate some doctrines, compromise some doctrines, or downplay some doctrines, we can stay in the conversation and we can keep people with us. And so while modernism is flourishing in culture, liberalism is growing in the church. And all liberalism is, is the accommodation of Christian orthodoxy to modernism. And it comes in pretty quickly because America is changing pretty rapidly I mean, it's the Roaring Twenties, right? And God's, we, we don't need God anymore. And we have skyscrapers, et cetera. So, so as modernism accelerates, liberalism accelerates pretty quickly. And Machen wants to step in and say, um, this is a fool's errand. Uh, if you think you can win over a culture and still be a voice in culture, and not have even a semblance of Christian identity, it is an utter fool's errand because the fundamental problem is there is a wide gulf between man and God. And he says this about 60 pages into Christian liberalism, whereas modernism sees no divide between man and God. And uh, Machen says, no, there is a wide gulf. <laughs> and that wide gulf is sin. And, um, you know, again, he has that incisive mind to get to the heart of the matter. Uh, but, I, but I think that's what's happening, David. It, it's with the rapidity of cultural social change, the church really rapidly changed. And the poster child of all this was Harry Emerson Fosdick, preaches his sermon in 1922, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And, you know, undermines the virgin birth, substitutionary atonement, inerrancy of scripture. It says the fundamentalists believe this way, but there's another way to believe. And we're not saying the fundamentalists can't believe that. We're just saying, isn't there room in the church for tolerance here? Uh, and a condition I, I think, of low visibility. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, um, you know, that sermon definitely was a catalyst um, for Machen and 
sermons he started preaching that then became the fodder uh, for the book. In 1923, the concern J. Gresson Machen felt for the direction of the church found expression in a short book he called Christianity and Liberalism. Published by Macmillan, the book instantly became a lightning rod in the fundamentalist controversy. So Christianity and Liberalism is published in 1923 and mm-hmm. quickly becomes a touch point in the debates at Princeton and in the PCUSA. Right. Can you talk about that genesis, the genesis of that book? Uh, how did he come to write it and what kind of impact did it have on readers at his time or during his time? Yeah, so it, it grew out of sermons he was preaching. Machen became quite the figure. Uh, and I think, again, it, they were looking to Princeton. And with Warfield's passing, Machen is now the lion. And uh, I remember even seeing advertisements for Machen preaching sermons. It almost almost looked like a prize fighter billboard. You know, come, come watch Machen knock out liberalism. <laughs> And and uh, I'm not sure what Machen thought of those, but you know, the promoters were doing it. So this is a fight. Uh, you know, Paul Paul talks about fighting the good fight of faith. Uh, we are to contend for the faith once delivered, and this was a situation in which Machen was not looking for a fight. The fight sort of came to him, as it were. But what he wanted to do was not make this a denominational thing. I uh, didn't want to make it a sectarian thing. He wanted to make it an, a thing of historic Christian orthodoxy. So what he does is he takes every single doctrine of historic Christian orthodoxy and says, here's what historic Christian orthodoxy holds. And by the way, it coheres and makes sense. But here's what liberalism says. And so what do we do? Doctrine of God, doctrine of the Bible. Doctrine of uh, or doctrine of scripture, doctrine of God and man, because those two go together. What we think of God and how we then see ourselves, and then it's the doctrine of Christ, and then it's the doctrine of salvation, and it's the doctrine of the church. And in the doctrine of the church, he doesn't get into you know Presbyterianism versus Baptist. He doesn't get into sacraments and um, church offices. It's what is the role of the church, and he said. I mean, to me, it's my favorite part of the book. At the very end, he says, here you are battered and beaten up by the world all week long. You come into church and what do you hear? We hear the same thing you hear out in the world. You hear some guy up there reading from the newspaper and commenting on today's headlines. He says, that's not the church. Uh, We come in, it's, um, uh, you're giving people stones instead of bread. We come into the church because we need the bread of life. Give me the bread of life. That's the church. And now we are in church. We are literally washed over by the refreshing waters of the gospel and of Christ. We are nourished. And now we can go back out to battle the world again. Um, So that's what he's doing in the book. It's just what are the historic Christian orthodoxy positions? And liberalism is a mile away. It's the opposite. And therefore, it is not... Liberalism is not a version of Christianity. It's antithetical to the real thing. So good. Thank you. You know, this debate in this book uh, has come to define Machen's legacy. Hmm. Uh, Do you think that's fair? I know there's a lot of talk about Machen being a warrior, being a contender, being a fighter. Uh, Do you think it's a, a fair understanding of the man? Well, I mean, to the extent that we want to say when there is a challenge to the faith, we need those Athanasius's contramundum against the world. And we need the here, here I stand at Verms. And I think 1923 was a here I stand moment. But just as Athanasius was a full person and Luther was a full person who also had quite a sense of humor, uh, same with Machen. And, you know, as I look at the book, I come away from the book not just saying, oh, wow, we got such a great argument. Let's go intellectually beat up the first liberal we find. I come away from the book saying, uh, as, as, um, oh, who was it? Was it, was it Murray or Warfield who would say, isn't the reformed faith 
grand. Uh, I, yes, I, just go, I just go away from the book thinking, well, isn't this the best? Our doctrine of God, uh, our understanding of scripture, our understanding of Christ, our understanding of the church, uh, you know, that you can read this book and and not come away wanting to get into a fight. You can come away reading this book rejoicing in the beauty, truth of the gospel. You know, I wonder too, in in the focus on Christian liberalism and constructing a personality out of that book, what are some of the other characteristics of that Machen clearly exhibited that are often overlooked? Well, your neck of the woods, he's a New Testament scholar. I mean, he's got a Greek grammar. He's got what was two incredibly uh, scholarly books, The Virgin Birth of Christ and The Origin of Paul's Religion. And even though scholarship is, I mean, I'm talking to you, David, like New Testament scholarship, is it every three to five years a book is sort of obsolete because of the amount of stuff you all put out? That's probably right. <laughs> and and he, Machen, his arguments are still cogent mm-hmm. century later. With and, German liberals saying you need to read it and interact with his arguments. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like he was respected. Mm-hmm. Uh, then on top of that, uh, Here's John Wanamaker's department store in Philadelphia with a radio antenna up on the roof, broadcasting out over Philadelphia and across the river into New Jersey. And every Sunday afternoon, Machen hops on there and gives a talk, not to laity. He's given talks to people he doesn't even want to assume are Christians. And he gives these short, little, beautiful theological um discussions that that are not patronizing by any stretch but as, but don't assume that they have any knowledge either and it's just this clear teaching and then he starts a seminary i mean that is no easy thing to start a seminary and uh, then he starts a, a mission agency which then leads him to get it's a little a little uh, paradoxical to speak of the in the independent board for Presbyterian foreign mission. <laughs> so, so the sense shivers down my spine. <laughs> so, so I get it. Um, but that takes some doing and then, um, nomination. That's quite a life. It is quite a life. That's right. It's tempting to think that the world of 1923 is farther removed from 2023 than it actually is. Sure, a lot has changed, but as we've already seen from Machen's book, there's a lot that hasn't changed. As we consider the forces of darkness opposing the church today, it can be overwhelming. But it can be just as encouraging to remember the battles of the past and learn from them. With that in mind, I asked Stephen how he thought the issues of today differed from Machen's and his answer was different than what I expected. Uh, well, on this podcast, we, we've been discussing with guests the similarities and differences between 1923 and 2023. When it comes to this issue of Christianity and liberalism, what are some issues in your experience that Christians need to pay special attention to today in avoiding liberalism? I think they're the same issues. I honestly think they're the same issues. Of course, Machen wasn't dealing with uh, transgender and gender identity. And the liberals of that day would have been as anti-homosexual as the conservatives would have been. So we have those new issues, of course. Um, I don't think pluralism was as rampant. It was beginning, especially because of the the way they were rethinking missions um, was was moving towards pluralism. But that that's the big one for us today. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are some new issues in our moment, uh, or maybe new textures to issues in our moment that I think we have to pay attention to and, and be able to speak to. But at the heart of the matter, it's it's back to that either there is a great wide gulf uh, between us and God, and that is fundamentally our problem. And so we must have a substitute or else we are without hope. Um that's really the essence of it. And any compromise of that, you're not preaching the gospel. And so I think Machen not he was willing to leave Princeton 
and start a startup seminary in a brownstone in Philadelphia. He was willing to leave the mammoth Presbyterian Church USA for a handful of churches to start a denomination. Uh, Machen understood that God doesn't need big to have influence. God doesn't need culture to have influence. God can work through those who are faithful. And all Machen want, I mean, it's a handful of students at Westminster when it starts. And all Machen wanted to do was be faithful. And I mean, I think about this. R.C. Sproul used to talk about this. He would do this game where he'd sit down with a legal pad and write out 100 of the most influential people in the reformed world of the 20th century. And he said he could draw a straight line from every single one of them back to Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, the influence, the true impact that Westminster had. And you think about it today. What, what is Princeton's endowment? Like, is it up in the billions now? Um, and and yet it's David and Goliath, right? Um, so I think that's a, we can't give in the, into the temptation of the myth of cultural influence. Mm. We have to remain faithful. Um, and I think that's a, that to me is, is the main takeaway uh, from Machen. Part of the reason Machen's story remains so powerful today is that he wasn't just a critic. Just take a look at your phone. It's easy to find self-proclaimed prophets these days. We all know exactly what's wrong with our institutions and leaders. What's hard is doing something constructive about it. Machen didn't just offer a critique of the church, he poured himself into building new and better places where a biblical faith could flourish in the future. In our day and age, there are still many who are willing to draw lines like Machen did, but fewer seem prepared to invest in solutions the way Machen did, at great sacrificial cost, too. Hmm. What can we learn from the church and parachurch ministries that Machen began after writing this book? What can they teach us about building a better future, should the Lord tarry? Hmm. It's one thing to tear down. It is quite another to build up, isn't it? And we, we sort of live in a moment where we just like to tear at each other. Um, and, you know, you could put out something on Twitter, really intend nothing by it. And lo and behold, you've offended someone and it's off to the races. So, so we, we do live in a moment where there is this, this almost sort of culture of nastiness. And sadly, it's crept into the way we engage within the church and engage in our theological conversations. Potent, maybe it's the media ecology itself that is the problem. I don't know, but but it's it's a call for us to recognize the we we need to we need to present the alternatives. So, in many ways, what what we're doing with theological education, whether that's undergraduate education or seminary education, is a beachhead on the sands of higher education. Uh, you, you look at the colleges and graduate schools and what they've been doing for the last couple of decades, that's why we're dealing with what we're dealing with now in culture. They, that, those things have been said in the universities and graduate schools for the last 30, 40 years. It's just chickens are coming home to roost now. So we are a true beachhead, uh, a, a, a theologically conservative confessional educational institution is a beachhead. And, but there's a flywheel effect from that. You know, again, going back to Westminster's influence, you don't need to be big to have impact. And it's amazing how lives can impact other lives. So taking the time to do institutional building that's faithful and that isn't just for a year or the fads of the months, uh, but is building something for the generations. Uh, that's that's hard roll up your sleeves work and um you know but we're called to do it and it's it could be easy for us to just do the tear down thing and get clickbait it's going to be a little bit harder for us to sit down and write a 250 page commentary <laughs> no one will read <laughs> no well, hopefully not hopefully not <laughs> 25 <laughs> well, there are 334 words yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> if you ever write a commentary on Isaiah, my heavens. Oh, I would take my whole life. <laughs> no, but I think <clears throat> aside, I think that that building up is, is we are called to confront and contend for the faith, but we're also called to build up and, and, um, and, you know, God blesses those institutions that are faithful. We don't always see it, uh, but we know that he, that it's all part of his plan and that he will. Yeah. You know, it made me think of a quote that I came across. Um, Machen said, what is today a matter of academic speculation begins tomorrow to move armies and pull down empires. Wow. I think that's really interesting. The way that we interact with, well, the way that we train up people in higher education and teach them to confront things that are coming out of the ivory tower, a secular ivory tower, is is helpful because ultimately those ideas make their way into the pew, pulpit and pew, sadly in some churches. Many thanks to my guest, Stephen Nichols. Join me next time for my conversation with Al Mohler as we discuss his story of leading Southern Seminary away from liberalism and the lessons he learned from Machen along the way. Yeah, I think silence is the biggest compromise. I, I think the mood of non-confrontationism on the part of so many is, uh, is the form of compromise that's the, that's the most seductive right now. Mm-hmm. And, and you see this in people who say, look, I, I just don't think we need to fight over that. Let, let's stand over here where we can be unified. The problem is that ground of where you can supposedly be unified. It's a, that's a shrinking piece of land. This episode of Christianity and Liberalism was brought to you by Westminster Seminary Press. Westminster Seminary Press has published a brand new edition of the book this show is based on, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen. This 100th anniversary edition features a new forward by Kevin DeYoung and is available to order now at wtsbooks.com. Listeners to this podcast can get a free download of the Christianity and Liberalism audiobook at checkout when you enter the promo code MACHEN23. That's M-A-C-H-E-N 23. This podcast was based on the book Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gressa Machen and hosted by David Brionis. This episode was produced by Josh Curry and Jimmy Atkins. Audio captured by Paul Quorum, edited and engineered by Will Boblitz. Our theme song was written by Timothy Brindle and produced by Nobody Special. Thanks for listening. Major wrote Christianity and liberalism to demonstrate they're two completely different religions. Liberalism denies man's wicked condition and divine inspiration with which scripture was written. Us Christians are convinced scripture's truly factual, but liberalism denies the supernatural. Major's book definitely showed Christianity and liberalism are diametrically opposed. It's not a different version of Christianity, it has opposite views of God and humanity. Often disguised with Christian terminology, they back the serpent's absurd philosophy. So when we call you a liberal, it's not just political, but rejecting his virgin birth and all of his miracles from trusting in science. But against God, it's disgusting defiance. Self is your trust and reliance. The line is drawn in the sand. Christ is gone and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. We bring the antithesis. The lamb's dripping wrist is still the only answer for man's wickedness. The line is drawn in the sand. Christ is gone and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. See you now. With Machen, we will tell Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell Machen press men, to be honest Don't call it Christian if it essentially is godless Christianity's based on events God accomplished Christ was sent to bring redemption, he promised yeah. Not just an ethical leader, respectable teacher But God in the flesh, yes, our blessed redeemer An affront to human pride You can only be saved by faith in Christ who was crucified Amen. Our greatest needs to be redeemed by the Son It's not what would Jesus do but what Jesus has done since we're slaves that doubt pride and lust we're in desperate need of rescue that's outside of us an understatement to say that we're flawed in need of what Machen called a creative act of God cause we're torn by sin we've been abhorring him not just sick but dead we must be born again God's enemies his arrogant opponents who can only be saved by vicarious atonement judgment fell on Christ in my place unrighteous guilty sinners are only righteous by grace scriptures historical acts they are certain Jesus the God man the supernatural person we need new hearts he's the compassionate surgeon by his death 
death and resurrection, he's smashing the serpent. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. We bring the antithesis, the lamb's dripping wrist is still the only answer for man's wickedness. The line is drawn in the sand, Christ is gone and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. CNL, with Machen, we will tell. Faith in Christ, still the only way to be redeemed from hell. My intention is to show, when I'll mention in this flow, Machen's words are as useful as a century ago. Uh -huh. Liberalism breeds destruction, it's hopeless. Today it's deconstruction and wokeness. Rooted in paganism, atheism, like Satan's mission to make CRT state religion. These abominations we see to this day in denominations like the PC USA. Why embrace Machen's great wisdom in light of the claims of his racism? In 1913, Machen wrote Mom complaining, angry about Princeton's campus integration. I can't believe the decision of Warfield. But this cancer of heart, I'm sure the Lord healed. See, Warfield became Machen's mentor, an instrument for Machen to repent more, showing his need of the Savior to change him. But consider the Lord's grace of sanctification. Machen became friends with an African American named Charlie Machen, gladly and cherished him. As a matter of fact, Charlie had a cataract. Skin color did matter as Machen had his back. Paid for the operation, stayed with him in the hospital. Christ changing Machen, not an impossible obstacle. From his love for his friend Charlie, it's quite clear Christ was changing Machen partly. Any bigotry left, it's not there any longer. Perfected now in the presence of his father. The line is drawn in the sand. Christ is gone and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. We bring the antithesis. The lamb's dripping wrist is still the only answer for man's wickedness. The line is drawn in the sand. Christ is gone and he's man. Upon the rock of the word of God, we will stand. CNL with Machen, we will tell. Faith in Christ still the only way to be redeemed from hell.